Hello and welcome to the FTA Thought Leadership Webinar Series. This webinar is entitled, Empowering Women in Supply Chains, Why It Makes Good Business Sense. My name is Heather Kiggins and I am the Events Coordinator at FTA. During this one-hour webinar, we will share with you some statistics and present the global overview of women in supply chains. We will observe some of the discrimination faced by women at the workplace and we will present some very practical tips and success stories showing how real impact with very positive results can be achieved. Before proceeding with the webinar, I'd like to share with you some webinar logistics. So everybody is aware, everyone is on mute. If you do have any questions, please post them in the chat box located on the right-hand side of your screen. Please post your questions throughout the webinar and we will do our best to answer them at the end. If we do not find time to answer your questions, we will answer them offline and share with you in the follow-up email together with the webinar recordings. As a reminder, you are welcome to follow us on social media at fta underscore intl dot org. We invite you to join the conversation by posting your comments, quotes, or interesting facts using the hashtag FTA Webinars or Thought Leadership. So let's move to the agenda. Following the introduction by myself, I will introduce FTA Senior Manager of Stakeholder Engagement, Anisha Rajapaksa. She will present Women in Supply Chains in the context of FTA. Followed by Anisha's presentation, Alison Tate from the International Trade Union Confederation will present the global overview of women in supply chains. Lisa Seuss from Fairware Foundation will then introduce the context in India and present some very practical tips, particularly for suppliers and brands. Mohamed Zahidullah, who is the head of sustainability at DBL Group, will then present the issue from a Bangladesh perspective and introduce some factory level initiatives. We will then proceed to a Q&A session. So now that I have presented the agenda, let's put a face to some of the presenters. I am Heather Kiggins. I have worked at FTA in the communications team since 2010. I work specifically on all FTA events, including the FTA annual conference, our local events taking place around the world, and webinars like this one. Anisha, joined FTA in 2015. Her role is to pr provide the overall leadership for stakeholder engagement activities with the aim of facilitating multi-stakeholder dialogue and cooperation. This aims to support members and to strengthen FTA's mandate to promote the values of international and sustainable trade. She is an international development expert with over 15 years of global expertise. For our guest speakers, Lisa Seuss is the India Country Coordinator at Fairware Foundation. She is responsible for Fairware Foundation's work in India, the verification activities as well as F F Fairware Foundation's workplace education program. She is an experience, she has experienced in multi-stakeholder dialogue and cooperation between the private and public sector in global supply chains. Alison Tate is the Director of Economic and Social Policy at the International Trade Union Confederation. ETUC is the global body of labor unions and represents 180 million workers in 162 countries. Alison has expertise in national and global policy areas across international trade and investment, social policy, human rights and trade union rights, amongst others. Her current role includes representing unions in bodies including the United Nations, the G20, and international financial institutions. Finally, Mohamed Sahadullah is the head of sustainability at DBL Group in Bangladesh. DBL Group is one of the largest companies in the apparel and textile industry in Bangladesh, which supplies to the large brands globally. Zahid has been with DBL Group for 15 years, working in the fields of social and environmental sustainability and corporate strategy uh, together with management consulting. He is managing several sustainability projects, including initiatives to empower women in supply chains. Now that we are, uh, for those that who, who are not familiar with FTA, here is just a very quick background. FTA stands for the Foreign Trade Association. It is the leading business 
Association of Global Commerce that promotes the values of international trade and sustainable supply chains. FTA offers two services, the International Trade Policy Service and Sustainable Supply Chain Services. International Trade Policy advocates to ensure that decisions made at the highest policy level support members to maximize the benefits of international trade and sustainable supply chains. Through Sustainable Supply Chain Services, we offer two services, the Business Social Compliance Initiative, which is the leading supply chain management system that supports companies to drive social compliance and improvements in factories and farms in their global supply chains. While the Business Environmental Performance Initiative, BEPI, is a business-driven initiative supporting retailers, importers, and brands to improve their environmental performance in supplying factories worldwide. This year, we are celebrating our 40-year anniversary, and we were pleased to welcome our 2000th member to our network just last month. We are a truly international organization. We have representatives in 14 different countries around the world. And through our network, we reach out to 47,000 factories and farms, which in turn reaches out to over more than 3 million employees. So now let me hand over to Anisha, who will proceed to present the women's empowerment, women in supply chains in the context of FTA. Anisha, it's over to you. Thank you, Heather. So um, let me begin by just giving an overview of where we're coming from. So from FTA data captured through our, our audits, we found that women make up well over 50% of FTA members' supply chain workforce. And as an association that promotes sustainable trade, we also firmly believe that economic and social development globally can only be achieved to its fullest through the active engagement of everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me, especially women. Now, members are strongly committed on, to the issue of empowering women in supply chains globally. We also believe that supply chain sustainability can be strengthened if we invest in women's empowerment throughout the value chains. And as an active contributor to the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, we are also committed to working with its members at the highest level towards meeting SDG 5, namely to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. Our initiative on, on business social compliance that Heather mentioned earlier, um, that our members adhere to clearly makes it an imperative to focus on the protection of female worker rights, going beyond the focus on discriminatory practices. We support our members with a broad range of tools and activities to monitor, strengthen capacities, and share information while influencing key actors towards improving labor conditions in the supply chain. And as part of our ongoing BSCI system manual revision, FTA will also ensure that enhanced guidance is provided to our member companies to ensure that female workers are able to have the, their rights protected and achieve their fullest potential. We do, do this because we believe that training, skills development, and awareness raising are fundamentally important to shift the culture of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable when it comes to the protection of female worker rights. Furthermore, I must add that the UN guiding principles on business and human rights are already embedded in the BSCI Code of Conduct and reiterates the corporate responsibility to respect human rights, including women's rights, and the need for more effective due diligence and access to remedies for related abuses. As the leading business association of over 2,000 members, we strive to leverage our collective strength to make positive change on the ground. And we also believe in the power of partnerships and collaborations to achieve greater impact. Because on many of these critical issues, businesses cannot do it alone. We are creating long-term collaborations with partners that share our values and are committed to accelerating positive and tangible change. In an effort to reinforce BSCI's objective, we will be in the coming months looking to command strategic initiatives in three of our key sourcing countries, India, Bangladesh, and China, and developing impactful, scalable, and replicable projects through a gender lens. For India, we are re responding to the reported increase in the incidence of sexual harassment and violence against female factory workers in the apparel industry. 
For Bangladesh, we will be focusing on empowering women to rise above the factory floor level to supervisory and management positions and reduce the gender divide and enable their voices to be heard. For China, in partnership with the International Organization for Migration, IOM, we will be looking to identify what we can do together to protect female migrant workers. These targeted efforts to empower women in supply chains um, enable our members and producers from all regions to collectively address this important issue in their supply chains again through a gender lens. Of course, while we see that there are increased initiatives over the last decade by companies, NGOs, unions, governments, the UN, and international coalitions, it's very clear that much more needs to be done. There is a real imperative for intentional actions and deliberate policies to move things on the ground. Today it's clear that empowering female workers is not just the right thing to do, but actually is good for business. Thank you, Anisha. Um, now we can move straight to um, Alison Tate, who will provide a global overview of women in supply chains. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much. I hope everyone can see the slides in front of you. Great. So let's go to the first slide. Firstly, as a trade unionist, I want to first acknowledge that the role of women in work and the role of women in global supply chains is really a fundamental issue for the way in which we want to organize women workers. As a woman myself, and of those of us who have spoken so far, what we're really talking about is not just women feeling empowered in society, but also in the workplace. And because of the power dynamics that play out as someone as an employee or as a subcontractor, then I really want to start the conversation by acknowledging that the whole trading system, the way in which our employer-employee relationships play out, is about power. So therefore, those of you who don't necessarily identify as a feminist, you're hearing a feminist speak to say <laughs> that the kinds of dynamics between men and women, not just in the workplace, but in society and in the family, is actually really relevant to this conversation. And of course, that's very different in different countries with different histories and different cultural perspectives. So coming from a global perspective, it's actually shocking to know that the statistics around gender-based violence are horrendous. Actually, 35% of women worldwide have experienced violence, whether physical or sexual. 35% of women. And between 40 and 50% of women experience unwanted sexual advances or physical contact or other forms of sexual harassment at work. So hence what we're speaking about today is trying to address that, first of all, there's a need to recognize the problem. And it's not from a specific culture or a specific uh, workplace. It's actually a global problem. And it's in all workplaces and in all countries. So when we talk about the global trade system, then you'll see from my slides that 60% of global trade is dependent on contracts in supply chains. And the statistic on the second dot point, about 94% of workers in supply chains of major multinational companies comprise a hidden workforce. What that means is that only 6% of workers are directly employed. So companies taking responsibility for the conditions and the wages and the safety in a direct sense, is only covering 6% of workers. So that means 94% of workers, most of us, and that's in a formally recognized employment relationship. Beyond that, where the majority of workers in developing countries, and more and more in developed countries, friends, are actually informal work. Really, the nature of work is becoming more and more precarious. People don't have a sense of jobs security. They don't 
have a sense of what kind of um, conditions or wages in the future may be applicable to their lives and their dignity. So that's where we're coming from, from a trade union perspective, of both wanting to ensure that people do feel empowered in the workplace, that their rights, their fundamental human rights are respected, and where they're violated, where there's a problem, that there's something they can do about it, that there's legal redress, that there's a grievance mechanism, as Anish mentioned, that there's remedy for that. And so we very much will come to a mom in a moment to the different tools that are available, but we very much want to place this conversation within the broader context of women's rights as workers' rights and as fundamental human rights. So if we go then to some specific examples, you can see them on the slides there, and I, can I assume that you can read that for yourself. But what I want to say is that the risk of exposure to violence is often greater in jobs and in different industries or sectors where work is informal or precarious, where wages are low, where workers are stopped from joining or forming trade unions, and where management accountability is low. So I'm assuming if you're coming from the perspective of working for a company that is sourcing from or is providing goods or services into a global supply chain, where the management responsibilities are actually, first of all, to address it, there's a problem, and then to take action on it. Because if we look at the underpayment of wages or violence in the workplace, then they're actually criminal issues. There are issues that are addressed in law. And okay, we need to address that in many countries those laws are either not respected or the labor inspectorate is under-resourced or not doing its job effectively or that there's really impunity. And it's up to companies to ensure that those legal responsibilities are fulfilled. So hence, when we talk about what needs to be done at a workplace level, then it's really full and consistent compliance with the applicable laws or the applicable labor standards. And so that's important for your company or your supplier or your subcontractor to be aware of that. So I'm not going to speak only about gender-based violence, but because that is often so under-recognized, people find it a scary thing or a threatening thing to even recognize. And part of that is because women don't feel, women in the workplace often don't feel empowered to report it. So it's for sure underreported, but it's also, and why is it underreported, we should address. Very frankly, because if it's a supervisor who is the protagonist in, in an abusive situation, then a worker who doesn't have representation or doesn't feel that they can talk about it with their supervisor or take it to management because she won't get her next shift or she might be dismissed for making that complaint. And that's across the world. In every country, that's a concern. And it's a concern that comes to the attention of trade unions. And very often why we're asked to intervene because a worker herself does not feel empowered to do that on her own. And frankly, neither should she. We should have mechanisms for addressing issues of violations of fundamental human rights. So also just to point out that in addition to gender-based violence that happens at work, domestic violence, which as I've already pointed out, is way too common in way too many places in most countries that also has an impact on women's capacity to work. It can spill over into the workplace. So, for example, through prolonged or frequent absenteeism, that's a concern, where women feel they can't concentrate or their productivity is impacted, or indeed even where they may be stalked at the workplace by a violent partner, following them from the home or from their community into the workplace. So all of these issues are relevant to workplace action. So I've 
set out there an international framework because I'm coming from a global perspective. Obviously, many of these things are discussed in forums like the G20 or the United Nations Far From Workplaces. But what they're trying to do is actually set the standards and the framework for action being taken at the local level. And that's the only place for the action to be taken locally. So we're counting on the kind of people who've joined this webinar to acknowledge and take action in your job, in your workplace, in your company. So it's really important to acknowledge that to address gender-based violence or to address violations of women's rights at work, there are plenty of frameworks. We don't have a lack of recognition at that level. What we have is a lack of action locally. And so to, to explain, there's actually not yet, and we hope that there will be, but there's not yet an internationally agreed law that deals with the many different forms of gender-based violence or discrimination. There are international labor standards, and those of you who are familiar with the International Labor Organization, you will know that there are labor standards around discrimination against women in the workplace, um, or migrant workers, or women, uh, workers with disability. It's one of the core labor standards on discrimination in employment. But the other fundamental core labor standards I want to refer to, which are really relevant to this conversation, are on freedom of association and collective bargaining rights, on child labor and forced labor, as well as discrimination in employment. But the, that framework on the slide that you see in front of you talks about both the spaces within the United Nations, in the International Labor Organization, and in agreements between companies and business associations on addressing these issues. So I'm just going to speak about global framework agreements for a moment because we have Saeed, our colleague, who will speak about the conditions in Bangladesh coming in a moment. But the Bangladesh Accord is obviously a very famous one where there are legally binding commitments on the part of companies to address fire safety and building safety. And you know that often for women in a factory-based context, having access to security, access to fundamental occupational health and safety, being able to access clean water, being able to freely go to the bathroom and have bathroom breaks, being able to leave the building in the case of an emergency, like a fire or building collapse, these things are fundamental human rights. So if we're not addressing these as ensuring that the compliance with those kinds of standards are actively aware every day of the working week, then we need to be addressing those things first, that compliance with fundamental labor standards. But really what I want to share with you is a really strong message that violence and violations of fundamental rights should not be a part of the job. They should, we should be protected and know that we can go home safely at the end of our work so that helping workers and employers agree on policies and ensuring good practices that prevent violations of women's rights and gender-based violence, that actually empowers women workers to take action. And so I would finally just say that uh, because we, hopefully we can have some engagement through some of the questions that people from the webinar uh, participants might have. But I really just want to go to the slide on union expectations. And these are expectations from workers <laughs> that not only do companies respect but also promote freedom of association. It's fundamental that workers can actually associate, can join a trade union, can form a trade union, can have a voice in the workplace that's not just their own individual voice, but that they can address those issues that come up as problems and find ways to solve those problems. So I know the culture of trade unions is very different in different workplaces and in different countries, but it's really fundamental that 
that we look at women having a voice in the workplace, not through a hotline, friends, not through a suggestion box, but actually through a process where their voices and their concerns are really represented and taken seriously by management. That's what we see as fundamental worker workplace industrial relations. And so to improve those relationships is actually my appeal to you in this call today, to make sure that women have a voice in that process. And so respect and promotion of freedom of association and being able to take those issues that they identify into collective bargaining to ensure that wages are sufficient to live on, to have a dignified life. That So we have a minimum living wage, including for pregnant and breastfeeding women, that the prevalence of sexual harassment at work and the conditions in which women can take maternity leave or services uh, as well as of course in Are we thinking about international to be for another time? Your company is taking action to ensure have the space and the security and the safety in the workplace, whether it's through their trade union or through a women's committee within their trade union. But if we go on to speak about the requirements for due diligence that Anisha mentioned earlier in this call, then that due diligence process is to address women's rights and workers' rights as fundamental human rights. So there's plenty of reading there. I've um, listed for those who want what's happened with specific case studies or at international level. I don't think we have time today to go into those, but very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison, for, the, for presenting such eye-opening statistics and uh, really convincing uh, st uh, statistics from a global perspective. Um, I think it's put a lot of food for thought for the, the conversation going forward. Um, so now let's move forward to uh, the, um, the India context and presenting uh, some very practical tips. So for this, I'd like to introduce uh, Lisa Seuss from Fairware Foundation, who will present some on the ground uh, experience. Um, over to you, Lisa. Thank you very much, Heather, and thanks everyone else listening in today. It's really encouraging to see that there's a lot of interest in this topic. I have the pleasure today of sharing uh, some of Fairware's experience that we gathered on the ground in India and Bangladesh, um, but also to talk about some practical strategies for brands and suppliers um, if they aim to address gender-based violence. Fairware Foundation has been working on gender-based violence um, and gender equality in India and Bangladesh since 2012. We first started with a program uh, with support of UN Women at that time where we were looking at raising awareness among uh, both management and line supervisors, but also, of course, workers. And as a second step, after a first awareness raising training, we helped uh, the factory to establish anti-harassment committees. So um, adding to what Alison said, that would be a typical access to remedy grievance mechanism approach to ensure that on a factory level women have access if they want to report grievances. And next to that program, we also started in 2014 in cooperation with the um, EU delegation to India with a skill development program where we train both male supervisors on uh, sexual harassment and better team communication and women workers with both um, soft skills but also technical 
practical skills. I decided to say that we're looking into opportunities with FDA to possibly scale up this program in the future, which would be very encouraging, I think. So, and then to get you all excited about taking action yourself, because like Alison said, that's what we want in the end, um, I want to share some positive outcomes in my next slide on what we observed during our work, but also some of those points are mirrored in uh, research and experience of other organizations and stakeholders as well. So the obvious hard fact first positive outcome is, of course, that you're legally compliant. There are a lot of international standards, like from the ILO, but in many countries, encouragingly enough, there's also um, national legislation. In India, you are legally required, for example, to have a workplace level anti-harassment committee. In Bangladesh, you have a high court verdict that requires you to do so. So there is movement, but of course, the implementation is lacking in many instances. So another thing we were looking at in our programs was as a first step toward this legal compliance to also first create a better understanding what constitutes sexual violence. Because in discussions, we often observe that the understanding is limited very much to grave forms of physical violence, uh, such as rape, but um, other forms that are maybe even more prevalent, such as being sexual violence or there's this whole attitude of, okay, it might happen, but not in our factory. And it's also not acknowledged that the impact is really grave, that women workers, if they are being abused, and they are, they might just not report it, are more prone to, let's say, leave the factory. And then it's often not acknowledged that that is due to that abuse, but it might be chalked up to them moving for yeah, marriage obligations or other things. So the very first step, and the positive outcome we could see in our programs is to create that better understanding also for the women workers that it's their right to address, let's say, being shouted at or unfair dis um, dismissals related to sexual harassment. Um, we could also observe that the confidence of those trained workers and their skills, as well as of those of the supervisors, increased sometimes really dramatically. We had workers who weren't even able to introduce themselves in the first session and at the end of the program gave a speech in front of 100 people um, sharing about what they learned. So there's a tremendous improvement in self-confidence and uh, knowledge. And all of that, of course, um, impacts the working environment really positively. We got feedback that shouting on the work floor reduced. Um, productivity got a lot better. Um, workers were less likely to, to leave the factory or to be absent. So there's a lot of positive impact here that we can see um, in the work floor itself that's really tangible. And now I think it would be interesting in the next slide to share how we can leverage all those positive outcomes for you as a brand. And sometimes what I find is that many brands know that their business practices do impact issues like overtime and wages, but when it comes to gender, um, it's often viewed as a cultural problem. So it's something that happens in the local context, and many brands are still not sure how they and their business practices can impact that specific issue. But the very good news is that brands can do a great deal to address gender-based violence in their supply chains. It's not rocket science, and it's not necessarily something that requires a lot of additional resources. Uh, many of the strategies I'll, I want to introduce apply generally to a good due diligence and monitoring system. And we have tested these strategies together with our U European member brands and their suppliers. So the very first step, I'd say, is that you re really need to get to know your supply chain. You need to know where you're sourcing, what your production locations are. And then it's good to commit to long-term partnership and shared responsibility to tackle any issues that you might find. Um, <clears throat> because it is a really com complex and sensitive issue. And we noticed that if the, if the supplier can't be sure that you'll be there next season, it's just not very likely that they'll actually open up and really work on the issue. So and that's also where transparency come in. We, we have um, we saw in our trainings that many suppliers um, <coughs> oh sorry something in my throat um, we saw in our trainings that many suppliers that we managed to set up those committees and that women workers actually started to to open up which is not a small thing because yeah there's a lot of uh, power imbalance and cultural stigma and then they finally managed to, to voice their grievances but then we had instances where HR managers destroyed those meeting minutes because they were afraid that if it 
would show up later in an audit, they would lose business. <clears throat> so that's important that you as a brand uh, make it clear that you want to promote transparency and uh, that you will not leave the supplier if they do address these kind of issues. Of course, it's also relevant that you review your own sourcing policies and try to reduce production pressure wherever you can, because production pressure might lead to supervisors that are stressed who are much more likely to act abusive. There's some interesting research by Better Work, for example, documenting that if there's excessive overtime, women workers are much more vulnerable to sexual abuse in uh, night working hours. And we also saw that high targets um, can lead to systems where it's very easy for supervisors to extort sexual favors um, because they have to say that the target has been reached and then they can leverage that in a negative way against the woman worker. I really also would like to echo the point made by Alison that social dialogue is crucial and absolutely needs to be encouraged. I think we have the most um, positive impacts in factories where, um, for example, a union or a local uh, labor rights NGO was involved in the process and in the program. We implement our, all our programs with local partners, and that's definitely um, a crucial success factor in actually um, achieving a sustainable long-term impact. And then, of course, capacity building, such as through those uh, awareness raising programs, either through international organizations or to get local partners or unions, are equally crucial. So there's a number of things you can build into your existing systems, and that, of course, also uh, support other issues, uh, such as wages and overtime, in a positive way. Um, in my next slide, I want to share a little bit about what you can do in a supplier level, and of course brands can discuss these steps with their suppliers and in their monitoring of suppliers, check whether those steps are being taken up. And again, the very first step would be to identify, acknowledge, and define the problem, so to move away from a culture of it's not a thing in our factory to we acknowledge that it might be a thing and we do have ways to address it. Um, so it's important that you adopt clear policies where you outline that you are not um, – that sexual harassment is something that you're not accepting in your factory, that you have uh, policies um, for equal remuneration for, for men and women, uh, maternity, all of these things, and that your HR procedures are, of course, linked to those policies. Then again, training workers, line supervisors, and management on what constitutes harassment and setting up a functional grievance mechanism are really crucial to have a systematic space where women and other workers, of course, also can go to voice their grievances if there are any. Again, involving a local union or labor or women's rights NGO is just really important for the, also to overcome the power dynamic that you have in the factory and to have an outsider who is knowledgeable on the issue and who can help women who are sometimes really, really young or illiterate um, to come forward and to express their grievances. And again, also the factory has, of course, a role to play in reducing economic pressure, uh, production pressure in the factory, so that's equally crucial. Um, and of course, the time today is really limited, but I would like to point out that we have this um, gender-based violence resource kit that we developed together with the ILO Training Center. I saw it in Alan's reading list, so thank you very much for that. And there's a lot more information in there on strategies, tools, um, practical approaches if you want to build a stronger um, system in your supply chain or in your supplier um, to address these points. And uh, before I close for today, in my last slide, I would like to talk about um, the specific roles of line supervisors, because a lot of the points that we discussed so far have been about systems and grievance mechanisms, and of course, it's really crucial that you have that and that there is a system. We also find that, that line supervisors who are often exactly between the workers and the, the on the shop floor level, and then management who might have really good intentions, but it's not that connected sometimes to the workers, are a very crucial um, target group in this whole issue. Because, of course, we often still find that while the workforce might be predominantly female, um, I think Anisha mentioned it's 50% in India and Bangladesh, it might be even more than that, but then the supervisors are mostly male. So, of course, there can be an enhanced risk of abuse. Um, there's economic discrimination because women are in all likelihood not able to rise to supervisory positions, which leaves them with less income. 
And of course, there's limited trust to report issues if you are a women worker in a line, but your supervisor is male and might not trust you. And we have made really good examples and good um, experiences with skill building programs where we train male supervisors to improve their team management skills, so to employ better techniques to yeah, to, to lead a line productively without resulting to, to shouting or um, demeaning punishments. And for women workers, the training um, is aimed more at technical trainings, but also at soft skills, so they can increase their to rise to supervisory levels and then also be a visible person in the factory where other women workers can go to report their grievances um, if they have any. So I think that's something that's really important to focus on next to the grievance mechanism to talk more about line supervisors and their specific role. And yeah, I think the, the next panelist also has a lot of interesting experience, but I will, leave the, I will leave the handing over to Heather. Thank you very much for this moment. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa, for your input. Um, I think you presented really some very practical the, the importance of, of line supervisors. Um, so now let's move to the, the Bangladesh context where uh, Mohammed Zahid, Zahidullah from uh, DBL Group in Bangladesh, um, he will present some factory level initiatives. Uh, Mohammed, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hito. Good morning, everyone. So I just take you through our experience what we have been doing here in Bangladesh. So basically, if you want to see the parallel industry in Bangladesh, it's almost about $30 billion size. And the industry comprises of almost 80% female workers. And in DBL, we have 7,974 female workers in our garments manufacturing unit. Next. Next slide. So some of the ongoing programs, what we have designed is, you know, we are not just focusing on one thing, rather in a holistic way we have been working. So we have this female supervisor leadership program. Then there's a woman health initiative program. There's a factory initiative program, open factories initiative. Then the sexual and reproduction health rights, SRHR, together with full Kim Basic Kingdom Netherlands, and also the financial literacy. So I would like to now focus on just the female leadership supervised program. So here, actually, this particular program, we started in the backdrop of uh, in the year around 2012. And basically, the concept came in because, you know, what we have seen that, you know, whenever the disturbance in factories have been happening due to various reasons, the unrest has happened. We have found that it's only the male members who are in this particular thing. It's not the female workers who are part of this particular thing. So what we decided is that since we already have, we need to have more and more females in the organizations, and our, uh, in terms of employment recruitment, because around 2012, we had only 30%. So over the years, we wanted to increase, and today we are having almost 44%. And then we also thought of coming up with the supervisors, because, you know, if you go on to see a swing line in the garments factory, more than 50% are the female, and then the people who are leading them is male supervisors. So, you know, this particular communication gap on various issues can arise. So we thought that, you know, since we had this women empowerment program where these workers, women workers had got a lot of leadership skills, communication skills and other things, we thought we should make supervisors out of them. And we started this in-house particular training program. So it's a program where it runs for almost about uh, 24 days, 24 working days, and it's just about one hour or one and a half hours of each day. And we have almost about 11 particular programs on this thing where it is also on uh, communications, motivation, motivating others, then also on uh, boom, uh, this particular thing, the work study program. So it's got the mix of technical and the soft skills both. So on it, we have almost 23 female supervisors. In DBL, we have 250 swing lines. So almost 15% of the swing, swing lines, and now we have female supervisors. And, and there's an increase of almost about 107% in the salaries after they get promoted from a swing operator or something. Like we generally pull the swing supervisors. They have been working in the swing lines as senior operators and operators. So we have pulled them from there. So there's an increase in their in, uh, income, which is 107% almost on an average. And the best part is that the productivity is almost 2.98% they're more efficient, you know, than compared to the male supervisors. It's 
quite natural, you know, when in a swing land, when they are a mix of male and female and more than 50% is female, then, you know, there are a lot of issues which male supervisors do not understand. So, again, there's a communication gap. And when there's a communication gap between the team members, you know, productivity can never be high. Now, you can imagine, you know, a female leading the swing line and female workers are there. So, we have, you know, one of our supervisors very wisely said she, when she was asked, Khadija is her name, she was asked, what is your achievement as a supervisor? So, she said that I'm able to understand women issues more better than men. So at least I have a very good communication with my female team members. I'm able to understand the problem and I'm able to address this problem. So the best part, if you want to see of a leader, is nothing but you know understanding the team members and team bonding. So if we have female supervisors in the garment swing lines, the team bonding, team understanding will be more, and definitely the productive comes in all. Then women, due to the natural instinct, they are better in housekeeping. And if you want to see if the housekeeping is good, there is more than 50% of the problem of quality issues is automatically solved if housekeeping is good. And women are more better than men in this regard also. And we target to create almost about 10 female supervisors each year with the addition of female line chiefs every year, five female line chiefs every day. These female line chiefs will be leading two lines at the upper level. Next. Uh, next slide, please. So with regard to the uh, turnover, also what we have seen is that the turnover is very low. It's 2% because, you know, what has happened, because we have now these three female supervisors, you know, this has been, these people have become our ambassadors, you know. They have become now ambitions, like, you know, they have created a desire for others in the factory also, you know, for the female workers that also, yes, they can also become supervisor. They can also have a high income level. So the turnover has been down in the factory and because of the other thing also uh, like you know SRH other programs and all and the re uh, reduction is almost 36 percent less in terms of uh, absenteeism and the best part of the business is that you know these 33 supervisors in their swing lines their productivity which is high annual contribution it comes to almost about six hundred twenty four thousand dollar worth of extra production and this is not at all a small amount it's really really a big amount and uh, we purely feel that, you know, like factories, also other factories in the country, they should come up with this particular thing in, uh, of female leadership, supervisor leadership development program, which helps everybody. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Our vision for female workers is to be the most attractive employer for female workers in the garments industry of Bangladesh. And we also want to work in partnership with other industries in Bangladesh to replicate and scale up activities that protect and empower female workers in supply chains. People might ask why we want to work in partnership with other industries. The reason is that, you know, we at DBL, we believe in collective goodness. If just DBL is good, you know, business is not in Bangladesh. If collectively country as a whole, all the factories are good, then there's business in Bangladesh. And when there is business in Bangladesh, then people will definitely come and look for who are the ones who are doing good. So we feel also it's as our collective responsibility that, you know, we should be partnering with others so that collectively we improve upon. Further, I would like to uh, add also that, you know, the program, what we have undertaken, this is very simple to do. It has got nothing of a, a very complex nature because the programs are very focused on the practical side of getting a good output. And the resource person comes from in-house from any factory. The resource person for in our case is the HR manager, the production manager, the quality manager, the sample making manager. So every factory, they have all these managers. And what is required is just maybe in two months or three months to give about two or three hours to groom these people. And another thing is that, you know, uh, what we feel is that, you know, we talk, have issues of, about this child labor and other things also. What we feel is that, you know, when more and more female empowerment comes in, I mean, the increase in income, like, for, uh, for example, for female uh, supervisors, the incomes have gone up by 107%. So at least these people who become supervisors, once their income level goes up, you know, in their family, the education of children has a continuity. And this has a linkage where, you know, the, in the future, the child labor rates in the industries can come down. So what we feel is that, you know, this is a program where everybody should look into it, think about seriously and come into it. And we at DPL, we are 
looking forward to work closely with the FTA to jointly work on a program, how we can roll out this particular program with other factors within our clusters and with other brands and other things. So thank you all for your listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sahid for presenting this uh, such solid figures and uh, your positive experience from the ground um, and congratulations for for the such positive initiatives that uh, yeah are bringing such good benefits uh, to women in in your your workplace. Um, before moving to the Q and A session, um, Anisha Raj, Raj, Anisha will pr present um, the next steps for FTA. What's coming next for female empowerment? One moment. Thank you, Heather. So, so after this webinar, because this work has been ongoing um, for a while now, and but at the same time, this is the time that we are going to be looking at uh, kickstarting initiatives on the ground. So as I mentioned previously, we're looking to, together with Fairware Foundation, um, commence a project that would focus on preventing sexual harassment in supply chains, but together with the um, skills development in order to raise the women's standards um, higher into managerial roles. So next month, on the 10th of August, we will be having a producer forum together with the Fairware Foundation on preventing sexual harassment in supply chains. And the following day, it will be open for members and stakeholders, and it is a consultation uh, on the topic of how business can protect the rights of female workers in supply chains. It's because we start um, developing the program Fully, we want to get the feedback from our stakeholders as well as uh, members uh, to let us know, you know, your perspectives as well as to how better we can strengthen it and also add value to what you're doing. Following on from that, um, in October, we are having the first ever regional sustainability symposium, which focuses on sourcing countries in Asia, so that's South and Southeast Asia, but also China. And the overall topic is promoting business, responsible business practices in Asian supply chains. And under this, the issue of the empowerment of women in supply chains is a key theme. So more information about each of these um, can be found on our website. And although I've not put it on the slide, um, there is also work underway to um, begin work, um, begin a project um, on the um, raising the status of women in supply chains, and that the work on Bangladesh will also be sharing that on our website in due course as it develops. So there's a lot of re really exciting initiatives out there, and we would welcome businesses as well to really, um, you know, come on board with us on this and participate at these uh, initiatives with us. And if you have any ideas, our members as, and stakeholders who are listening in, please do get in touch with us. Uh, and that will be really helpful as we shape our work in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Anisha. Um, if you do want to get in touch with us, please contact um, info at fta-intl.org. Um, so now when we will move to the Q&A session where we will open the floor to all the panelists to answer questions from the, the audience. Um, we received the very first question from uh, Carol Wills. Um, she asks, is it really possible to bring about change um, without any kind of legal enforcement? Um, we see some positive examples on the floor, but there continues to be uh, employers who are only interested in short-term profits. Um, she also asks, could trade unions have a role in enforcing human rights? I'll direct this question to Alison Tate. Alison? Thank you. Well, I think Carol really hits the nail on their head, right? Uh, I hope that... Uh, expression translates for everyone, <laughs> but it's a really key point. The reality is we have the laws in place. In all countries, it's illegal not to pay a minimum wage. It's illegal not to, um, to address violence in the workplace. So these issues that we're speaking about today, it's not that we don't have the legal framework. We do. It's that there is lack of enforcement, or that there is lack of willingness to address the problems. So I think Carol's question is that um, 
where women workers do not feel empowered to raise concerns, then we have a really fundamental issue there. And, and this is what we've been addressing in the call today. Her question, could trade unions have a role in enforcing women's rights? We're not police officers. We're not enforcement agents. It's actually the role within a workplace that the, the managers or the supervisors ensure that enforcement of the correct standards and laws are in place. But for sure, trade unions have a role in raising these concerns. But you know, in many factories that, and, and I'd be interested to know on the percentage of those joining the webinar today, how many have unionized workplaces? One of the big problems is that trade unions can't do their work if they're not there. So if managers don't actually recognize the role of a trade union, there's no trade union presence in the workplace, and that's very often, it's only about three or four percent of garment workers globally are actually members of a trade union, not because they don't want to be, but because they're not allowed to be or they're afraid to join. So it comes back to the point I made right at the beginning about the power dynamic. And okay, a relationship between a trade union and a manager can often be seen as being um, two, two forces fighting against each other. But the reality is representing the voice of workers collectively is the role of a trade union. And if there's no trade union presence, then we can't take that action. So, Carol, if you're um, listening to this point, you might have a follow-up question, but it's not our role to enforce women's rights or workers' rights. For sure, our role is to promote them, but what we want to see is that management and governments play their role. And that's at the workplace level, at the national level also, in ensuring um, labor laws are enforced. And at the international level, that's the work we do through the International Labor Organization. But in dealing with complaints or um, reports of violations, the first responsibility is, of course, the management. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Uh, now we've received lots of very uh, interesting questions which we would really like to answer during the webinar. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Uh, we will follow up with all the questions that you've put forward um, and we'll, we'll address them offline and send to you when we wrap up the webinar and when you receive the, the recording. So you'll receive all the answers to your questions. Um, to finish, we could just, I'd just like to do a quick round between Alison, Lisa and Zahid. Um, what would you say is the top challenge to empowering with, uh, female workers? Um, if I could start with uh, Alison and then we move to Lisa and Zahid. Alison? So I think as a trade unionist, you can all guess what I'm going to say, right? <laughs> The top thing to empower women workers is for women to have a voice and a say in, uh, in their conditions, um, in their wages and conditions. So that is the right to join or form a trade union. That's the top thing that can make a difference. Thank you, Alison. Uh, moving on to Lisa. I think what we really need to make happen is to bring uh, someone like Saheed, who has all those really interesting business case numbers, together with civil society organizations in the country, such as the trade unions there and uh, NGOs, and then together lobby the government so they make sure that the legal framework is there, but also informed. And I really think that's the next way to go, to put together all our experience and knowledge from the people working on it and just leverage it to the next step. Thank you very much, Lisa. And finally, from Zahid. Uh, what I see is that, you know, it's women who understand women better than men. So here, it's the, what is missing is the mindsetting of the people not realizing that, you know, if you want to empower women, you, the women should be coming on the top of the ladder. And most importantly, all through, you know, this, uh, uh, the belief, you know, you see, uh, there's a very false belief that women are not capable. The sad part is that we humans, men, all of us 
It's the mother at home who grooms us to be a good human being. And again, when we are in our career or growing up, it's our wife who are our best emotional support. So at this two particular critical stage of life, when women are playing an important role, why not in the day-to-day -day life, you know, this particular thing should come up that, yes, women needs to get more and more empowerment and come on the right roles at the right place for the things. It's just the mind setting, not realizing the contributions, what they have already been doing in our personal life. This is what I say. It's belief, the mind setting needs to be changed. And challenges, whatever is there, the collective partnership is what can work out like, you know, the public-private partnership more and more, you know, like, you know, in the industry, if I come from the garments industry, like bit partnership between the brands, the association, and the factories, this collective actions is something, you know, which can do something, you know, bring in change. It will not happen in a day. It will take time, but we should begin. That is what I say. But bottom line, it's the women who understand women better than men. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zahid. That was uh, very clear, and uh, I think it's very uh, like uh, highlights the very top challenges for empowering women in supply chains. Finally, let me move to Anisha, who will highlight the top um, challenge from her perspective. Thank you, Heather. For us, like in terms of a top, top challenge, the thing is when you talk about women's empowerment, there are very many dimensions, but for if yeah, from where we started, it's about women in supply chains, women at the factory floor level. And so for us, it's really critical that the initiatives are um, conceptualized and implemented where there is strong buy-in from the factory level, because we do not want to also, in, you know, transpose some an NGO project that may really work well outside, but we cannot really just do that. So it is really useful and if these are challenges as well, we really want greater buy-in from, from companies to really strongly implement these at the factory floor level because that is the main focus of the work we do. It's about the empowerment of women at the factory floor level in supply chains, global supply chains. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone for your contributions. Um, I think we've had a very well-rounded input on the empowerment of women in supply chains. Uh, we've had the, the, the global perspective with, from uh, Alison with really convincing uh, statistics on uh, where women stand currently in the workplace. We've had practical tips from Lisa, and uh, we've had a really inspiring case study from Zahid in Bangladesh. And also from FTA's perspective, Anisha has presented uh, the work that we are focusing on and uh, let me just remind you about the, the events that are upcoming uh, in August uh, to October. Um, for, for all FTA members, please do invite your, your producers to join the, the FTA uh, with Fairware Foundation uh, producer forum which, which will take place on the 10th of, of August and uh, members and stakeholders, you're all welcome to, to put your interest forward for, for the other events that are upcoming. So thank you, everyone, for, for your interest, and uh, we will come back to you with the follow-up email, uh, which will include the, the recording and the additional questions that we were unable to answer during this time. Thank you very much, and goodbye. <laughs>